I am Mrs. Sloan, and this is a video intended for my honors biology class. And this is part two of our chapter six on metabolic pathways and enzymes. And we have already, let me get myself here, we have already talked about, let me get to the front. Okay, um, we have already talked about energy and um, we have talked about entropy. We've talked about the laws of thermodynamics and we've talked about entropy. Um, we have talked about delta G and exergonic versus intergonic reactions. And we spent some time talking about ATP. So now this portion, we are moving on to specifically enzymes and redox reactions okay so for part two and if you're new then um, my notes are always down at the bottom in the descriptors of the video so you can go and um, use those and fill them in and then that's in column one there's a scaffolding for that and then in column two you can add in images and pictures that are helpful for you all right so metabolic pathways so we oftentimes just see this to this, A to B to C to D, et cetera. But really, these are all the metabolic pathways that occur within our cells. And each one of the steps in each one of these um, reactions requires an enzyme to facilitate that reaction. So let's talk about what that does. So on the surface of a catalyst, a catalyst is anything that makes a reaction go faster if it is an organic catalyst, it's called an enzyme. And typically they are made out of proteins, but sometimes they can be made out of RNA as well. But on the surface of that catalyst you is where your reactants bind. And this catalyst will facilitate causing that rearrangement of bonds in order to make your product. So that specific site on the enzyme where it binds, I'm just too big for everything. Whoa. <laughs> I, okay, stop, hold still. That specific site where it binds is called an active site. There, I'm making the screen a little bit bigger. Delay of game, sorry, penalty five yards. So here's your enzyme, here is the active site, and that's where the substrate binds. And remember, um, proteins are really specific, right? In their shape, remember there's primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary shape when we look at that, the structure. Primary is a sequence of amino acids. Secondary is either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Tertiary structure is the folding pattern imposed upon the secondary structure due to the R groups. Remember there's 20 different R groups and quaternary means there's more than one chain. So Enzymes, which are these organic catalysts, are very specific in their shape, and that shape is conducive to binding to their substrate. If the shape is changed at all of the enzyme, the substrate will not bind, and it will not be able to do its job. So on your notes, first of all, let's add, then add in this. We're at 6.3 in the notes. Um, we've already done 6.1 and 6.2 in uh, video one. Metabolic pathways are an orderly sequence of linked reactions, an orderly sequence sequence of linked reactions. Each step is catalyzed by a specific enzyme. Okay, an orderly sequence of linked reactions. So a catalyst is substances that can increase the rate of a reaction without being altered. So they're not destroyed by the process, they're not used up by the process, that's what it means. So it can increase the rate of the reaction without being altered. And an enzyme is an organic catalyst, usually a protein, and it can increase the reaction rate by more than ready, 10 million times, 10 million times. And the substrate, that's whatever's binding onto that enzyme. So when you talk about an enzyme substrate complex, that's this right here. When the substrate and the enzyme are joined together, that's referred to as the enzyme substrate um, complex. Your active site, you already got that. It's the part of the enzyme that binds temporarily with substrate. Part of the enzyme that binds temporarily with the substrate. Now, any factor that alters that is going to alter its functionality. And we'll take a look at that. Here, let me move along here. Now, see how this kind of looks like a mouth, like a guy, like an eye would be here. And these are some nice braids or something. Okay. So look at what would be the mouth. That is the active site right here. And you see when the substrate binds in, that enzyme temporarily changes its shape. And this is called the induced fit hypothesis. So it gets in that shape that is conducive to making that reaction go forward. So on your enzymes, um, 
let's see, da, 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 da. I'm sorry, any factor, this is under active site part B, any factor that alters the active site like a temperature or pH or an inhibitor, and we'll spend some time on that in just a minute, can change the shape of the enzyme and its functionality can change the shape of the enzyme and its functionalities because the enzymes can become denatured. So let's keep going and look at that. All right, so here we can see this temporary change in shape. So look at all the things you know first, right? So here you can see the active site. Here you can see the substrate it's binding on. And then here is your product right here. Anything that changes the shape is going to interfere with this reaction rate. So you only need a little tiny bit of enzyme, and the reason is they're not consumed by the by the reaction. Do you know what that is right there? It's Willy Wonka, you know, he's holding an everlasting gobstopper. So enzymes are not consumed by the reaction, so they can be used over and over and over again. All right, now, how they are named, that's the next thing on your notes. The enzymes are usually named after the substrate that, um, that they work on. So for instance, lipids, right? That's a type of fat. Uh, lipids are digested by lipase. Maltose is digested by maltase. Lactose, which is milk sugar, is digested by lactase. Sucrase digests sucrose, right? And do glucose and fructose. So on your naming, um, you have everything for that, but just in case you're only listening and not writing, um, because enzymes are specific to their substrate, they're often named for their substrate. And for instance, lactase digests lactose, and you just add in the ASE. So I'm gonna ask you this in class, what is your enzyme, enzyme name? So I'm Mrs. Sloan, so my enzyme name would be Sloanase, I guess. Um, if you wanted to, then you would know that that would digest a Mrs. Sloan, right? So you just, whenever you see ASE, you know you're talking about an enzyme. All right, now, how do they work? Let me move myself up here. So this, this looks difficult. So spontaneous reactions, remember how we discussed exergonic and endergonic reactions um, in our last video? Um, exergonic reactions, though they are spontaneous, there's always a little hurdle like to get going, right? This would be like if your mom says, hey, can you empty the dishwasher? You're like in your chair, you're relaxed, you're like, ugh, you've gotta overcome that inertia, right? So what if she offered you, hey, you empty the dishwasher in the next two minutes, I'm gonna give you 20 bucks. Do you think you would get up off uh, your, your get up out of your chair and go empty that dishwasher faster? You probably would. So think of that enzyme. It's motivating this reaction to go faster because it's lowering this initial hurdle, this initial hurdle of inertia to get this reaction going. And it makes it more likely for you to get from A to B. Now remember, an enzyme lowering this hurdle, you're not changing, remember delta G, your overall level of energy. So we start here and we end here. This right here, is your delta G. This is an exergonic reaction because this product has less energy than the reactants. It just makes it more likely to get going. So take a look here at this, okay? So let me go over here. So here's your starting point, right? And this first, the farthest one away up here, this is without an enzyme. This is the hurdle you would have to overcome in order to make that reaction go forward, okay? And then right here with an enzyme, the hurdle is much smaller, so it's more likely to go forward. Now, living in Southern California, fires have been a big part of your life lately, right? If you live in Southern California, and that has a lot to do with climate change. So we have less rain and the air is drier, right? And we worry about what? fires, right? So could it just be hot? Could there be a random lightning strike or something that starts the fire? Sure. Okay. That would be the likelihood of a fire without an enzyme, right? But if somebody is setting off fireworks in the dry chaparral, how about what's the likelihood of a fire starting then, right? It's more likely to move over. Weeds just don't spontaneously, even though even though they have more energy, right, and going down to ash has less energy, they don't just spontaneously start. You need a little something, something to get them started. You need a little spark. Could it come from a lightning strike? Sure, you know, but it's more likely to start with somebody not playing well with matches and facilitating that fire and making that exergonic reaction go forward. So energy of activation, that, that's this hurdle right here. Energy of activation is the energy that must be added to cause molecules to react, to cause molecules to react. The benefit of that hurdle 
is this hurdle of energy prevents molecules from spontaneously degrading. It prevents exergonic reactions from you not falling out of your chair right now um, for you not to rush too quickly towards entropy. It kind of prevents that just a little bit. Okay, enzymes speed up reactions by lowering the E sub A, by lowering the E sub A. So take a look at this diagram, see if it makes sense to you. Okay, you're measuring free energy here on your Y axis, the, the progress of the reaction here on your X axis. Notice the blue one, look at the energy of activation. Look at that without the enzyme, and then this tan one is with the enzyme. So the hurdle is smaller, so that reaction is more likely to go forward. All right, now this I think you'll have no problem with, a synthetic, a building reaction. Can you think of another name for a reaction that builds? Did you think of anabolic? Okay, so this would be a synthetic reaction, a degradation. Can you think of another name for that? Did you say catabolic? Yeah, catabolic would be good for that. Okay, so now let's talk about, and I mentioned these up above in enzyme substrate con, um, complex. I mentioned that factors would affect enzyme activity. So let's just take a minute to look at some of those factors and how they would affect it. All right, I'm just always in the wrong spots. Okay, here I am. So look at the rate of this reaction. Here is as you increase the substrate, right? What your reactants, that's what a substrate is. As you increase the substrate, then the rate of the reaction is going to go up. But you know what? Eventually it's going to level off. And the reason is you doesn't matter how much substrate you have, all your enzymes are busy. And so it'll just level off at that high rate. So the amount of substrate you have can affect your reaction rate. All right. Um, temperatures. All enzymes work at a specific temperature and pH. So if you look right here, this enzyme is going to work best at about 40 degrees Celsius. If it's too cold, it's not going to work. If it's too hot, it's probably going to denature. Remember when we talked about proteins and how you would denature them? Like if you crack an egg into a pan, at first the white is actually clear, but then as you add heat to your pan, right, the clear becomes that white because it's changing its properties. So once it's done, you can't undo that. Like when, once you've fried an egg, you can't unfry it. So enzymes, if they're, that's why you don't want to run a fever, really it's a high fever for long because your enzymes will start denaturing and then they will not function. So enzymes work at a specific temperature. So exergonic, or sorry, exothermic organisms like lizards and snakes, they're more functional in the heat of the day than in the cold of the morning or cold of the evening. Now, if you're a mammal, okay, doesn't matter what temperature it is, you know, within range, because this polar bear can just scratch off your entire face, whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon, because his temperature, because he has hair and he has fat, right? He's going to maybe be able to maintain his temperature and be active. His enzymes are free to work at all temperatures. All right, and this is kind of interesting. Siamese cats, the reason why they have their, their differences in their face here and their ears is because certain genes are activated to cause the coloration at different temperatures. And so their body is at different temperatures. And so which enzymes are active are different. Um, here are two enzymes. Both of them digest proteins, pepsin and trypsin. Pepsin is found in your stomach. And trypsin is found in your small intestines and it's secreted by your pancreas. And trypsin and chymotrypsin work best here at a, at a more basic, slightly basic pH. Pepsin in your stomach works better at a low pH. So um, that's where the enzymes are secreted and that's the pH of your, of your body along that way in your digestive tube. So specific temperature, specific pH, we've talked about the amount of substrate, right? These are all things that affect enzyme activity and this is giving you evidence for enzyme substrate factor 1B, okay? All right, and coenzymes. So coenzymes are things that, well, that's not like coworker, right? A coenzyme is working with that enzyme. And here you can see sometimes if a coenzyme could be a vitamin or another molecule, it could be, um, if it's a cofactor, maybe it's a metal, um, and they help the enzyme get in its appropriate shape for it to act as a catalyst. All right, and then inhibitors. So let's talk about in inhibitors. I'm just in the wrong place. In the, here, I'm gonna make myself smaller. That's what I'm gonna do. Now I'm very tiny. Okay, so here, 
these, this, I know this is going to make sense to you. There are competitive inhibitors and there are non-competitive inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors compete with the substrate or the active site. So for instance, you've heard of like carbon monoxide poisoning, right? So you don't want to have that, right? Carbon monoxide will compete with oxygen for your hemoglobin. And then once it binds, it will not let go. That's a competitive inhibitor and it is irreversible. It will not release your hemoglobin. And that's why if you're exposed to too much carbon monoxide, let's say from a heating unit in an RV or something like that, um, it can kill you. At first you get sleepy and then you get nauseous and, uh, and then you die. So, because you don't want it to compete with oxygen for hemoglobin. All right. Now, there are other inhibitors that obviously don't cause that. I just gave you an extreme one. Okay. Non competitive inhibitors, they do not bind to the active site. They bind to a secondary site called an allosteric site. But when they bind, look at the difference. Like here, look at your shape of your enzyme. It kind of comes to a point and a curve. Okay. Now, notice the shape. You, It's kind of like it's pinched in a little bit. Can you see each of these flowers? Flaps are not as open, they're pinched in. And that is a result of this non-competitive inhibitor binding at a secondary site, but it rearranges the whole enzyme by binding to that other section. It rearranges all of it and it causes it so that the substrate cannot bind. Okay. Now let me give you an example, and then we'll take the notes on there, of a difference between competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. Let's say you're in my classroom and I blindfolded all of you in my classroom. Okay, blindfold on, you can't even peek out the bottom. And I said, hey, you know what? Stand up, walk around, and when you bump into somebody, hold their hand. That's our product, is to have two people holding hands. Now, without an enzyme, and I time you, and I just wait for you all to find a partner with your blindfolds on, right? That would take a while. Now, what if I acted, and we repeated the same experiment over, but this time I was the enzyme, and I was running around in class, and joining your hands all over class and facilitating that reaction, then I would be like an enzyme facilitating that process. A competitive inhibitor would be if I was holding my coffee cup and um, a Diet 7-Up, now my hands are full. So I can't go around and facilitate that reaction. That would be a competitive inhibitor, all right? A non-competitive inhibitor, if something changed like, if Mr. Sloan came running in here and spilled coffee on my back, it, he didn't spill it on my hands, but because my back is burning, I'm not in the right shape in order to facilitate that reaction. That would be a non-competitive inhibitor. What are my hands in this reaction? Do you know? My hands would be the active site. You, individuals in my classroom are the substrate, you join together and holding hands with somebody, that would be our product, all right? So I hope that analogy helps. Okay, and on your notes, let's put this in your notes, for um, enzyme inhibition, this occurs when a molecule, the inhibitor, um, binds to the enzyme, enzyme and decreases its act activity. So um, on non-competitive inhibition, the inhibitor binds to the enzyme at a location other than the active site. That's like if coffee got spilled on my back, so my hands are still fine, but coffee spilled on my back. Um, so it binds to a location other than the active site, and that is referred to as the allosteric site. Let me spell it for you. A-L-L-O-S-T-E-R-I-C, allosteric site. Competitive in inhibition is if something else is in my hand, so I can't run around and do the reaction with you. So competitive inhibition is both the inhibitor and the substrate compete for the active site. All right. That's pretty easy, right? Now, let me show you how that type of inhibition, that allosteric site, can be really good in maintaining homeostasis, all right? So let's take a look at this metabolic pathway, okay? A goes to B, B to C, C to D, et cetera, and you have a different enzyme all along the way, and here's your end product F, okay? Now, you have enough of this product, F, whatever it is. Maybe it's thyroid hormone. You have enough of it. The thyroid hormone binds, look here to enzyme one, right? Here's the first reactant A, here's enzyme one. See the secondary site right here, this allosteric site? The product, when you have enough of whatever this metabolic reaction is, this pathway, 
it binds to it and look how it changed our active site. It went from curvy, right, to real pointy. So now this first reactant cannot bind on to enzyme one. And so by using this as you're, you're inhibiting the whole pathway, but super not wasteful, right? Because you're stopping the reaction at the very first step. You don't have to stop everything along the pathway, just the first step, right? It's like, if somebody parked a car in front of your garage so you couldn't get out, that would prevent you from your whole journey that you were taking, but it's stopping you at the very first step, okay? So that is an example of where you have end product inhibition when you have that allosteric um, site where the end product binds to it. And you can add that to your non-competitive inhibition at the end of that one right there on number one. Is this a good example is end product inhibition, end product inhibition. Okay, good. Now we've done everything we needed to about enzymes, but now I am pre-teaching something you're gonna need for the next two chapters. After chapter six, you're gonna need it for chapter seven and chapter eight, and you're gonna need to be familiar with the terms oxidation and reduction, okay? The first thing I need you to know, okay, the first thing that I need you to know is that electrons equal energy. All right, let me, let me get big so I can talk to you for a minute. Okay, remember your atom story, protons, neutrons, and electrons? Electrons, in the metabolic word, world, they equal energy. Now, do you remember what charge there was on electrons? Remember the charge on electrons? It's negative, right? So if you have a lot of energy, how could you have that energy if you had additional electrons? Though, if you have additional electrons, what's gonna happen to your charge? It's going to be negative, right? So your charge gets reduced. So when you hear the word reduced, I want you to think reduced in charge, but you have a lot of energy. Now, the opposite of that is being oxidized. And let me explain why that is, okay? Do you remember how oxygen is really electronegative? And if you hook up with oxygen, he'll want to pull. Remember, he has those six valence electrons and he'll want to pull your electrons away. So if you get oxidized, that means you hooked up with something that was taking your electrons away. Oxygen, let me give you two friends, hydrogen friend and oxygen friend. Okay, stick with me here. Think of a friend you have right now that's like a super awesome friend. Like if you forget to pack your lunch, they'll share when you used to go to school, they would share their lunch with you. Or if you are absent, they'll tell you what the work is. If you need a ride, they'll give you a ride. You know, you don't abuse it, but you know, they're very, very friendly. When you talk to them, they listen. Okay. Whoever that friend is in your life, which I hope you have one, I want you to label them hydrogen helpful hydrogen, okay? That's your hydrogen friend. Whenever um, a molecule hooks up with hydrogen, hydrogen will donate its electron gladly to uh, the other atom, okay? So that, it will always give you an electron. The opposite of that, okay, is being oxidized. And whenever you think of like another friend you have that's like, whenever you talk to them, it's always about them. They're always bumming food off of you, always bumming rides, always wanting to copy your homework. Whatever friend that is, think zero loser friend, and that is oxygen because oxygen is a taker, all right? Now, this will always happen in conjunction one with the other. So let me show you that, okay? So look right here. Um, they're running track. Think of the electron as the baton right here. This gentleman who is giving up the electron, this gentleman in the front is taking the electron. The one that gets the electron, he gets reduced. The one that lost the electron, losing energy, he gets oxidized. All right, let me show you another picture. Okay, so atoms become reduced and oxidized. What does that mean? So here's um, this compound A, he has a couple of electrons. He is going to give up those electrons to B. So B is getting reduced while simultaneously A is getting oxidized. So that's why they call it a redox reaction because one can't happen without the other. All right, so it's kind of like if you're handing off money, right? If I am giving you the money, I'm losing the money, losing the electrons, but you're gaining the electrons. It's happening, that transaction is happening at the same time. So on oxidation and reduction reactions, electrons are transferred from one reactant to another. When you get oxidized, you have a loss of electrons, um, which you lose those electrons by either losing hydrogen or, right, if you lose your good friend hydrogen, 
or you gain an oxygen. If you gain an oxygen, you will lose some electrons because you know what kind of friend that is. A reduction is a gain of electrons. Remember, you're getting reduced in charge. You're gaining electrons. And how can you gain electrons? By gaining hydrogen or losing oxygen, okay? If you break up with your friend oxygen, you're going to gain some electrons. Okay, now, Let's keep going. Let's apply this in um, in your notes. You have coupled reaction. Oh, and let me make sure I didn't screw up on this. On oxidation redox reactions, electrons are transferred from one reactant to another. Did I say that? Okay, good. So do you see where it says coupled reaction? Let me tell you what's going to go in there. All right. So we know chloroplasts do photosynthesis. They make carbohydrates, right? Makes oxygen. Mitochondria use those carbohydrates and oxygen to make ATP and give off CO2 and water, right? Their reactions are the reverse of one another. And the next two chapters that we are going to learn about, um, the next chapter we're going to learn about is all about the mighty mitochondria. And then the last chapter of this unit is going to be all about the chloroplast, all right? So let's take a look at this right here. Here's photosynthesis. Six carbon dioxide plus six water plus energy, right, from the sun. It's an endergonic reaction, and you make glucose and oxygen. Now, look, aerobic respiration is just the reverse of that. You start out with the glucose and the oxygen, and you oxidize that glucose into CO2, right, water, and energy out, the energy you release, you're going to use that energy to build ATP, okay? These reactions are coupled. Now, let me show you here, okay? So look at the top, okay? If you look at the top half is photosynthesis, energy, CO2, water, follow the top arrow, make sugar an O2. Go the other direction is cellular respiration, O2 plus glucose makes water, CO2, and energy. So what happens is in photosynthesis, this CO2 is going to become glucose. So let's look at the atoms. Make this make sense to you so you don't have to memorize it. This is carbon and oxygen. Now it's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So what did this guy get? He got hydrogens, right? So the CO2, if he gets hydrogens, remember that's your helpful friend, he is getting reduced. Where did those hydrogens come from? Can you see? Yeah, right here from the water. These hydrogens that you see right here on water, look, six, two is 12, right? These 12 hydrogens jumped into the CO2 over here, and here they are right here. Here are your 12 hydrogens. And then what's left is you have left is you have oxygens. So the CO2 gets reduced into glucose, whereas the water is getting oxidized into oxygen. Okay, now let's go the other way. In cellular respiration, you're taking your glucose and you're breaking it apart and you're breaking it apart and making it go into CO2. So it is getting oxidized, right? Because it loses hydrogens and the O2 is becoming water. It is becoming reduced. So the coupled reaction that you really need to put in your notes right there is this one, but I need you to understand it. All right, here we go. So it's the same thing I already told you, look. CO2 is getting reduced into glucose and water is getting oxidized into O2. Now these hydrogens right here are temporarily carried by a molecule called NADP. NADP is like our mule, okay, who takes the hydrogens from CO2, uh, or sorry, takes the hydrogens from water and hands them off to the CO2. So he's our temporary um, electron carrier. He is our mule, NADP. Now also we can identify the energy. The energy to make photosynthesis happen comes from the sun, right? Okay, now let's go do cellular respiration. The O2 is getting reduced into water and the glucose is getting oxidized into CO2. And this time our mule is called NAD. And NAD carries the electrons from the glucose and will ultimately those electrons will be given to O2 to reduce it down into water. And a byproduct of that will be ATP. So you might want to like pause the video and take a little screenshot of this and pop it into your notes right there where it says coupled reactions. Okay. One more big thing we need to talk about before we close out this video. All right. So 
I want to talk to you about when electrons move through an electron transport chain. Okay, think about if you're at the top of the stairs and you drop a ball and it goes da -da 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 down at the bottom, right? At the top of the stairs, it had more potential energy. At the bottom of the stairs, it had less potential energy. And it's bouncing as it goes along here. All right, now, if this were a membrane, oh, you know, there's going to be an impact of that ball bouncing on your stairs, right? Some along this membrane, there will be some um, proteins along that are able to capture the energy of that bounce of that electron and use it to transfer hydrogen ions from one side of the membrane to another side of the membrane. And I talked about this in video one. Do you remember that when we concentrated hydrogens on one side of a membrane? So take a look here. Okay. Let me stick myself over here. All right. So here you can have some um, energy from the sun. Okay. And you're going to use that energy to kind of uh, use an electron transport chain. And ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to pump hydrogen ions using energy, right? From the excited electrons. They're excited because they got excited by the sun. And you're going to pump hydrogen ions to one side of the membrane. Now, if you look right here, there's more hydrogen ions on this side of the membrane than this side of the membrane. So remember, they're going to want to get to the other side. Remember we talked about diffusion, right? You want to go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. And the thing is, there is a difference by threefold. I want to show you. There's more hydrogen ions on the blue side than the tan side. Also, there's a difference because there's more positive charges on the blue side than the tan side. And also, there's a difference of pH. So it's a difference in concentration, charge, and pH. So it's super motivated to go from this side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. But it can't go through the phospholipid bilayer, not because it's large, but because it's charged. And so it's going to go through this right here, and this happens to be an enzyme. Look at its name, ATP synthase, right? So you know what it's going to do, complex. So when these hydrogen ions come back in, you're able to take ADP and form ATP from it. It should say ATP right here, okay? So we're going to see this pattern in the next two chapters. So on your notes, what I want you to do, hang on, let me move. I'm having so much trouble moving myself. Okay, let's try it here. Okay, so on your notes, what I want you to write, you ready? Okay, and you're like, are you ready? So um, the electron transport chain and ATP production. So it's a coupled reaction in both photosynthesis and cellular respiration. High energy electrons are delivered to the system and low energy electrons leave. So high energy electrons are delivered to the system. And let's go back so you can see that, okay? High energy electrons are delivered to the system and low energy electrons leave. It is a series of redox reactions. So if this electron is here, this step got reduced, but when he loses the electron, he gets oxidized and the next step gets reduced and then he loses this electron, right? So it's a series of redox reactions, transfer of electrons um, from a new carrier and energy is released to pump hydrogen ions, so the energy that they temporarily have when they have that electron, that is used to pump hydrogen ions from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane, okay? Is released to pump hydrogen ions to one side of the membrane. An electrochemical gradient is established. It's a difference in concentration, more H is here than here, difference in concentration. It's a difference in charge, because they have a positive charge and a difference in pH because it has more hydrogen ions, which makes it have a low pH. Then these carrier proteins right here allow hydrogen ions to flow down their concentration gradient, and this energy is used to synthesize ATP. All right, good job, good job, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about this more in class. I hope you're having a good evening.